Celia Orcott, student and women's lib activist at Fulchester University, was found guilty of stealing an antique vase from her tutor, Professor Martin Archer. But her sentence was quashed on appeal. The case has been reopened, and today in the Crown Court, Winifred Archer is on trial for perjury and for conspiring to pervert the course of justice. Three weeks after Celia Olcott was sent to prison, Mrs Archer came downstairs one morning to find her husband slumped over his study desk. A bottle that had contained sleeping pills was found beside him, and he was dead. A coroner's court returned a verdict of suicide. The prosecution in the case of Winifred Archer has been brought privately by the members of Fulchester University Students' Union. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, you are Celia Marilyn Olcott, a student residing at Fulchester University. That's right. In 1972, you were convicted of stealing a vase from your tutor, Professor Archer, and you served four months in prison before your conviction was set aside. Yes, that's correct. Have you always protested your innocence of this crime? I have. And you now protest it once more? I do. I didn't steal a vase from Martin and Winifred Archer's quarters. I wasn't even aware of the existence of such an object. Evidence was fabricated against me and lies were told under oath. Winifred Archer could live with that afterwards, apparently, but poor Martin couldn't. He killed himself to prove it. My Lord, I object most yes, strongly. Yes, Mr. Logan. Uh, Miss Alcott, I must warn you not to tell us what you think or believe, but only what you saw or heard. It was a declaration of fact, that's all. It was not an admissible observation, and you must accept my ruling on that. I may tell you that you will do yourself no good by being insolent. Uh, at your trial, Miss Alcott, it was established that the resale value of this vase was £150, and police evidence was that two days after the vase had been reported missing, you visited your bank and you made a cash deposit of £150. Now, where did you get this money, please? I said that at my trial. It was given to me by Martin Archer. Your late history tutor? Yes. But Miss Alcott, giving testimony, Martin Archer denied point blank that he'd ever given you any money. Yes. Yes, that's right, he did. Well, how do you explain this, then? He lied. Professor Archer lied in court on oath. I'm afraid so. He had decisions to make, of course. Choices, just like the rest of us. I'm not sure exactly how he made up his mind how to act. But he obviously decided I was expendable, so he betrayed me. Can you enlarge on that, Miss Alcott? No. I don't think I can, really. People don't always act in a way you can understand. Martin Archer gave me the money to help with my work. The woman's lib movement, that is. And then chose to deny the fact. It was his decision. Yes, but Professor Archer also testified that he had no sympathy whatever towards the women's liberation movement. Yes, yes, that's right, too. More lies? Yes. And as far as the £150 was concerned, police evidence clearly showed that Professor Archer had made no such cash withdrawal from his bank. No. Well, that isn't so difficult, actually, to explain. I'm sorry? The fact is, he didn't give me the money in a lump sum. That would have been too obvious. It was for small amounts at different times, dribs and drabs. You're saying, then, that this £150 was an accumulation of money given to, given to you by Professor Archer? Yes. Given to you over a period of, well, what period of time? Uh, three, perhaps four months. Now, did you say this at your trial, Miss Alcott? No. Well, why on earth not? It's vital evidence. I didn't think I'd be believed. It was difficult, all that, very difficult. Lies were being told all around me. The effect of that in the end is to make the truth seem like a worse lie. So I resolved to be very careful in what I said. I knew Martin wouldn't be talked out of anything having once made up his mind that I was expendable. He was like that. His wife knew it and used the fact to manipulate him. It was she who made him lie and kept him lying too. My Lord. Yes, Mr. Logan. <coughs> uh, Miss Alcott, once again you have made observations about matters which in all probability are hearsay or conjecture. Now just listen to the questions and answer them. But this is all very important, my Lord. Winifred Archer was always persuading her husband to do things he didn't want to do. He told me of it many times. What, the professor told you about a certain state of affairs between himself and his wife? Yes, my lord. Well, of course, the difficulty is that since the professor is dead, your evidence is hearsay. Most of it will be inadmissible, but let's see how we get on. But once again, I will ask you no more accusations, you understand. Whatever you say. Now, Miss Alcott, perhaps it would help if you could tell us how well you were, uh, how well you were acquainted with the domestic situation of the archers? Um, 
Well, I knew it as well as an outsider could, I suppose. I went there for tutorials weekly, and sometimes Winifred Archer would drop into the study for a brief word before I left. Almost from the beginning, I could see they weren't a happy couple. He was worried about his wife's hold over him. He said he knew that one day she'd make him do something he'd regret, and that would be the death of him. The death of him? Yes. Well, Miss Alcott, why did Professor Archer confide in you in these matters? We'd grown close. Yes. Well, I suppose it's got to come out in the end. I kept quiet about it at my trial, but there's no point in that anymore. For just over a month, before the business of the vase, Martin Archer and I were having an affair. I see. Uh, how did this come about, exactly? How does it ever come about? We discovered we had things in common. Surprisingly enough, from my point of view, I'd always taken Martin for what he appeared to be, conservative, reactionary. But underneath that facade, he had some genuinely progressive ideas. Well, about women's lib, for instance. He quite astonished me by his understanding of what I and my friends were trying to do. That's why he gave me the money. He wanted to be part of our work, just so long as he didn't have to declare the fact publicly. Well, why did he fear making his loyalties public? Did he tell you that? Well, he was a contradictory man. Sometimes today, you find people who are crypto-conservatives. They shout for the left, but they lean to the right when the crunch comes. Well, Martin was that rather rarer thing, a crypto-liberal. He really fell for the cause of reform. Anyway, understanding between you ripened into love. Oh, come off it. Martin was lonely. And as for me, well, I suppose I was just susceptible. But I dare say the whole thing was injudicious. Are you saying that in general you regret the affair? Oh, yes. It cost too much by half. What does that mean? Martin's dead. Now, what brought the affair to an end? Well, just before the beginning of December, Winifred Archer found out what was going on. I went there for my tutorial as usual on December the 4th, and he said it would be better if I went away for a while, and he said I was to use the money he'd given me for this purpose. Now, that's the money he'd uh, contributed over a period of time to your women's lib work? Yes. So Professor Archer was now saying that you must use this money to get away from Fulchester. Is that right? Yes. Winifred Archer came into the study at this point, and she started, to, well, to curse me is the only way I can put it. She called me a filthy little whore, a tramp. She turned on poor Martin like a harpy. She threatened to report him to the authorities and put an end to his academic career. I mean, report that he'd been having an affair with a student, which would have meant he'd have to face a disciplinary committee. Yes. But Martin, well, he was a weak man. and Fulchester seemed to be his only security. Now, did Mrs Archer say anything else? She said she'd pay me, out, pay me out for what I'd done, no matter what it took. And this you took as a definite and a serious threat to harm you? You should have seen the state she was in. I was frightened, I just ran. Now again, Miss Alcott, this is something that you failed to say at your trial. Well, I was upset when Martin began to tell such black lies about me. That really was an awful experience. But then it occurred to me that he must be in trouble... He must be in need to behave like that. But you're in trouble yourself, surely. You're facing a prison sentence. You can always get through prison. It's something you're prepared to face when you're involved in social struggle. And it would have ruined his career if I'd spoken about our affair. Well, I couldn't take the responsibility for that. Martin Archer knew that his wife was capable of destroying him. So no matter what I'd said, he would have had to do as she told him. There was a sort of dreadful inevitability about it all. I was expendable. I see. Well, one last question, Miss Alcott. On December the 5th, 1972, did you visit an antique shop in Market Storley and sell an antique vase there? No. I was only ever in Market Storley once in my life, and that was over 18 months ago. Where were you, in fact, on December the 5th last? Fulchester University. I was in my room most of the day. The weather was shocking, so I just got on with my study. Thank you, Miss Alcott. Miss Alcott, you said that Professor Archer lied, that he betrayed you, found you expendable. 
Yet you don't seem to display any particular resentment towards him. Well, that is the case, isn't it? You don't feel any resentment towards him. Well, I realise this must seem strange, but where was the sense in being angry at Martin? He was the sort of man you could only feel sorry for. And anyway, he's passed judgment on himself now. Miss Alcott, I will Look, not I warn you again. Look, I must be able to say this, surely. He was a man with a conscience. It could only have been guilt that made him kill himself. His wife must take the blame for that too. She isn't only a liar, she's a murderer! Miss Alcott, you've confronted us today with two altogether new pieces of evidence, two things that you chose not to say at your trial, apparently. There were things I felt unable to say at the time, yes. Well, to take the love affair to begin with then, you're saying that you consciously performed the extremely noble, not to say heroic, act of refraining from mentioning this at your trial. I don't see it as noble or heroic. Well, Professor Archer was telling the most outrageous lies about you, and as counsel for the prosecution has pointed out, you yourself were facing a prison sentence, yet you still chose to say nothing. My dear Miss Alcott, you're asking the jury to believe that you're little short of a saint. You don't have to make it sound absurd. Then you must make it sound sensible, mustn't you, Miss Alcott? Well, the fact is, I felt guilty about Martin. By that, I mean that the affair was much more my responsibility than his. He was a weak man, and I took the initiative. You led your history tutor astray, Miss Alcott, a sort of student, femme fatale, and then you conveniently omitted to mention it at your trial. Look, that happens to be the way it was, <clears throat> and I certainly wasn't going to make matters worse by dragging the whole wretched story through court. Better a few months in jail if it came to it, much better. Well, it remains remarkable. <clears throat> now, this 150 pounds... You would obviously have needed a high moral purpose to confiscate monies donated to the sacred cause of women's lips. My lord, the witness did not confiscate monies. She has testified she was instructed by the donor to apply them to different ends. Well, unfortunately, with Professor Archer dead, we've only the witness's word for that, for almost anything, in fact. Why didn't she come out with these extraordinary tales at her trial when the professor could have been called upon to support or deny them? Thank you, thank you, both of you. That will do. I agree, Mr Lloyd, that the word... Uh, confiscate is improper in the context. On the other hand, I take Mr. Logan's point that we are now almost entirely in the realm of hearsay. Now, Miss Alcott, is there anyone who can support your claim that Professor Archer was giving you money for the women's liberation movement over the period in question? Well, that's a bit difficult. Martin wanted it kept secret about the money, so naturally I didn't tell anyone. Not even any of your closer colleagues? No. Too much danger from gossip. Well, is there... At least anyone who can support your story that you and the professor were lovers. No one there either. We were discretion personified for obvious reasons. But does it matter, honestly? This is a very serious matter, Miss Alcott. Look, I know that. I'm asking you, what am I supposed to do, tell lies? I should have thought we'd had enough fabricated evidence to be going on with. Let us press on, Mr Logan. Thank you, my lord. Now, Miss Alcott, you tell us that on December the 5th, you were at Fulchester University all day, studying in your room. Yes. Well, you weren't alone and confined from dawn till dark, I hope. There must have been occasions when you emerged and there would be those who could testify to that fact. Um, well, I went down to hall for breakfast, yes, and I spoke to a couple of people then. I didn't have any lectures that day, though. No, but lunch. What about lunch? I had a sandwich in my room. I had a lot of work to do, so I just got on with it. Until what time? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, um, tea time, yes. I went to hall again at six. So from just after breakfast time on December the 5th until 6pm, you saw nobody. Not a soul who could testify as to your even being at the university. I was in my room. It was such a dreadful day, there was nothing to do but work. I see. Yes, of course. Miss Alcott, does the name Kate Greer mean anything to you? Kate Greer? Yes. Nothing. Why should it? Well, it's the name given by the woman who, on December the 5th, sold an antique vase belonging to Professor and Mrs Archer to a dealer in Market Storley. The name Kate Greer, as I'm sure you well know, is an amalgam of two of your more famous colleagues and her address, Brabham Road, a play on the 
symbolic act of bra burning. Now, she's said to have had ash blonde hair. Well, that lets me right out, doesn't it? I'm dark, and I've always been dark. Yes, but if you had found out by some means or other that the dealer was short-sighted, Miss Olcott, and worn a wig, a wig like this, you'd have looked very much older in a wig like this, wouldn't you? But would a real older woman have made such a weak, feebly pointed joke about her name and address? That was where you let yourself down, Miss Olcott. That was where you betrayed your youth. It was you who sold the vase on December the 5th in Market Storley, wasn't it, Miss Olcott? My lord, I'm not sure if I'm being asked a question or told to confess to nameless crimes. Perhaps you could advise me on how I should reply. Counsel is asking you, Miss Alcott, whether or not you sold an antique vase belonging to Professor and Mrs Archer in Market Storley on the 5th of December last. Then the answer is no. You don't need to be reminded that you're on oath, Miss Alcott, do you? Of course not. No further questions, my lord. No re-examination, then you, uh, you may stand down, Miss Walker. Well, my lord, it... Uh, that is the case of the prosecution, my lord. My lord, it happens that I have certain medical evidence to call that won't take long, but it is quite vital, and as the doctor involved is a very busy man, it would help greatly if he could be heard first, that is, before the accused. Really, I'm not very partial to this sort of thing, you know, Mr Logan. Hard as it may be to believe, there are some of us in this world every bit as busy as doctors... However, I suppose if counsel for the prosecution has no objection, then I must accede to your request. I have no objections. Well, you may proceed. Uh, call Dr. Joseph Ross. Thank you, my lord. Dr. Joseph Ross, please. What is your religion? The Church of England. Take the testament in your right hand and read aloud the words on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, you are Dr. Joseph Ross, and you're in general practice at number one, Calderley Avenue, Fulchester? Yes, that is correct. And do you know the accused, Mrs. Winifred Archer? I have met her once, twice, yes. And were you also acquainted with the accused's husband, the late Professor Martin Archer? Yes, for about five years before his death, Professor Archer was a National Health Service patient in my panel. Then on the, uh, the morning of April the 20th last... I received a call from Mrs. Archer saying that her husband was dead. I went at once to their quarters where I found Professor Archer slumped over a desk with an empty pill bottle by his side. The subsequent post-mortem showed the cause of death to be due to a massive overdose of barbiturates. Mr. Logan, I'm most anxious to know where all this is leading us. Well, my lord, it leads to the professor's possible motives for his suicide. Uh, Mrs. Archer is charged with conspiring with him, and in my submission it is admissible. I understand that Mr. Lloyd has no objection. You say, Mr. Lloyd? Uh, it is so, my lord, yes. Yeah, well, go on. Yes, Doctor, were these barbiturates, in fact, pills that you yourself had prescribed for Professor Archer? They were, yes. Uh, Professor Archer had normally enjoyed very good health, but he had been through a period of stress some six months previously and was unable to sleep. I prescribed the pills accordingly. Uh, no doubt I did over-prescribe. They're always telling us that we do, but uh, I had no reason then to think that Professor Archer might use the pills for some other purpose. Yes, but had you some reason to think that at a later stage, perhaps? No, no. no. If I'd thought that, I should have once have checked on such prescriptions as had been issued to him and seen that anything dangerous was removed. I, um, I think I should say, though, that Professor Archer was a strange man and highly unpredictable. He suffered from anxieties being basically a timorous person. He found genuine assurance only in the sphere of his work. Elsewhere, he was indecisive, easily put upon, and uh, given to irrational fears. Was what sort of fears, precisely, Doctor? Well, for example, he came to me in, in early March about uh, swelling he had in the abdominal area, which was causing him some discomfort. And he seemed to have made up his mind before he even came into the surgery that this was a cancer. He was a hypochondriac, then, you're saying? Uh, no, no. Well, not consistently. What he plainly seemed to have at that time was a simple contusion caused by a fall he told me he'd had a few days previously. I told him not to be silly, to go about his business, to think of other things. And did that satisfy Professor Archer? No, apparently not. He came back to see me a week later, uh, March the 17th, that would have been, and said he was now sure that the swelling was a cancer, that it was growing in size, and he virtually demanded an exploratory operation. And what was your reaction to that, Doctor? Well, in 15 years of practice, I have never yet allowed a patient to diagnose his own complaint, let alone say what the treatment should be. I certainly was not going to begin with Professor Archer. I kept my patients. I made a very detailed examination. 
If anything, it seemed to me that the swelling was reducing nicely. Uh, sometimes in that part of the body, a contusion will take longer to reduce than elsewhere, you know. As far as I was concerned, I could see absolutely no reason for surgery. And that satisfied Professor Roger? On the contrary, he became quite angry. He started to say that if he could not get the kind of medical attention to which he was entitled from me, he would go elsewhere. Well, I did know that he had other things on his mind at that time. The trial of a student of his who apparently had stolen a valuable vase from him was about to begin, so I merely advised him to try to be calmer, but he would not be consoled, and uh, we did not part the best of friends, I am afraid. And that was the last time you saw Professor Archer, was it, Doctor? Alive, yes. So the fear of cancer could have remained very real in his mind. Oh, yes. Now I would say that it certainly did. It could even have assumed such proportions for him as to lead him into irresponsible action? Well, I have known such things to happen before, and uh, Professor Archer was a highly impressionable man. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Uh, Dr. Ross, were you called to the inquest on Martin Archer? Uh, to give evidence as to the disposition of the body after death and of having prescribed the barbiturate, yes. Then why didn't you tell the coroner what you've just told this court, that Professor Archer seemed to be under the impression that he was suffering from cancer? <laughs> I did mention his tendency to irrational fears, but I did not specify. You understand, I hadn't taken his little obsession remotely seriously. These anxiety-prone people are all the same. One week it will be cancer they're afraid of, the next it will be in cholesterol level or air pollution. But insofar as he didn't contact me again, I presumed that the matter had ceased to worry him. You'd no idea, then, why Professor Archer took his life? I'm sorry? Well, you obviously didn't think it was because of an unfounded worry about cancer. Uh, not at that stage, no. On the other However, hand, you I... appreciated that he had some very real worries about the trial of Celia Alcott. I didn't say that. Well, surely you've testified you knew that this was on his mind, perhaps causing the worry about the cancer. Well, I didn't mean to put it as strongly as that. I, I simply meant that a general climate of anxiety can help to give strength to a particular fixation, but I didn't gather the impression that the two things were connected. Yet the trial was a serious business for him, wasn't it? Consuming, sapping of nervous energy. He didn't speak of it directly to me. I know nothing of all that. Dr. Ross, in your experience, was Professor Archer an honest man? Honest? Reliable, given to telling the truth. Likely to be gravely upset, in fact, when for one reason or another he had failed to be completely honest. Right. Well, I don't see how Dr. Ross can be expected to answer that question. It's quite outside the realm of expert opinion. I'll put it another way. Dr. Ross, isn't there at least as much reason why Professor Archer should have killed himself over a lapse in, uh, in a matter of personal honour uh, as that he imagined he had cancer? Uh, sh surely there, there was no history of suicide attempts. Oh, no, no, no. But, uh, but if I don't misunderstand what you're saying, there is... Considerable difference involved here. I know nothing of lapses of um, personal honour, but I do know something of Professor Archer's physical condition. Exactly, and you've testified that he was a fit man. Well, Doctor, that's right, isn't it? You know, it's an odd thing in a life of doctoring, but one is forced to admit occasionally that the patient can know more than the physician. At the time of the post-mortem on Professor Archer, I asked the surgeon responsible to send me a tissue sample. I think he thought I was a bit touched. I'm not at all sure what my own motives were at the time myself. At any event, the results of the analysis did not come through until long after the inquest. But the sub-tissue of that swelling was, it seems, Malignant. Professor Archer was completely right. He was developing a cancer. The case of the Queen against Archer will be resumed tomorrow in the Crown Court. <laughs>